So I'm going to start. Welcome to our webinar. I'm saying it again, Donna Fishman. Um, welcome to Prevent Blindness and the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health. We have designated 2022 as the Year of Children's Vision, and this is one of many webinars that we have been conducting this year. Um, we've had several on children with special health care needs, and today we are turning, of course, to vision screening. Um, wanted to just give you a very brief background on Prevent Blindness and our National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health. At Prevent Blindness, which was founded back in 1908, we promote awareness and education to create vision health equity and ensure that all Americans, excuse my typo, receive needed vision and eye health services. And that goes for adults and for children. We cover the whole lifespan. We promote evidence and science, which is what you're going to hear today. We create many, many resources for parents and all adults. We have some resources for children as well as the curriculum materials. We have education and training programs, which you're seeing today. We promote um, greater awareness of vision and eye health through campaigns through all our social media. And we work to create systems and policy change at the local, state, and federal levels. We conduct technical assistance, and then, of course, we have all these webinars and our social media. So we're really happy to have you here. Um, Kay is going to present, uh, is going to talk a little bit more about herself, but I wanted to present um, Dr. Kay Nottingham Chaplin. We're so happy to have her, um, Kay and, and myself and Kara Baldonado make up our children's vision team here at Prevent Blindness. And so I'm going to turn the webinar over to Kay. Thanks so much. Okay, hello everybody out there in Zoom land and to those of you who will be watching later. Um, I am talking about vision screening birth through high school today and give you a little bit about myself. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for Prevent Blindness. I work with the National Center. I provide technical assistance and I oversee our national online Prevent Blindness Children's Vision Screening Certification course. I've been working in vision screening for 21 years. I've co-authored published papers regarding vision screening. I've presented nearly 250 national webinars and evidence-based vision screening lectures at international, national, regional, state, and local venues. I am a con um, contracted consultant for School Health and Good Light. And I'm also a consultant to the Vision Screening Committee of the American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Okay, I like to start out with stories because I love stories. So this is one of my favorite stories. This is a little girl who was in Head Start in my home state of West Virginia, true story. Um, she had a vision screening, did not pass. Um, Mama took her for an eye exam. She did receive glasses as treatment. When she returned to her classroom with those glasses, she walked to the doorway of the classroom. She stopped, she looked around, she saw this picture of giraffes on the wall, so she walks over to it and she looks at the picture and she turns around and finds her teacher and she says, oh, I didn't know giraffes had eyes. So after her glasses, this is what she may have been seeing before she had the glasses and it would be difficult to see the eye. And then after glasses, she can see that giraffes have eyes. And that story gives me chill bumps every time I tell it. So four learning objectives for you today that you will be able at the end of our time together, list vision screening tools from birth through high school, describe the relationship between poor vision and learning, List an important question to ask parents when conducting follow-up after a vision screening referral, and, and I'm actually going to give you two questions, and to describe resources to share with families about, one, the importance of vision screening, and two, scheduling and attending a follow-up eye exam when their children do not pass vision screening. So for good vision, we need straight eyes. 
We need eyes and our vision system to work correctly, and we need a focused and clear image from each eye so that we have this and not this. So how is clear vision helpful for children? It's helpful for clear vision. It's helpful for child development, education, child self-esteem and competence, improved classroom behavior, future employability, and lifelong independence. So let's talk about association between vision and learning. So I'm assuming that you guys can see this Henry look to the right. Well, what if this is how you were seeing the words? That would definitely impact your, your learning and maybe your classroom behaviors because that may bore you and you may want to be up running around instead. So this is a comment and I need to move you guys because I can't read this. Okay, this is a comment to um, a post and you can tell by the use of the word blackboard that it's rather old, but I still love it. I always thought I was just sitting too far from the blackboard to read the words and numbers the teachers were writing. It wasn't until my eighth grade year, having repeated sixth grade, that I was vision tested. Geez, what a difference. When I went back to school as a freshman in high school, I could read everything and my learning was so much easier. So these, uh, some comments from, or uh, summation of some studies uh, recently published. This one's actually a comment to a lion. This child was in fifth grade making C's and D's constantly in ruling class. But after vision screening and treatment that consisted of glasses, the behaviors calmed almost immediately. Three months later, the child was making B's and working on A's. And she said to the lion, you saved my nephew. This is a 2015 study looking at low income children ages three to five years. This study found, and I will be showing you a slide with the citations. This study found improvement in academic progress, improvement in confidence, improvement in behavior, an increase in focus during lessons, and an increase in classroom participation and interaction. This is a 2016 study that looked at 317 second and third graders in 12 high poverty schools in Baltimore City and found that children with uncorrected hyperopia did not perform as well on reading assignments compared with children without hyperopia. So with hyperopia, you're blurry at, at near. And a 2016 study in the UK looking at ages, uh, children ages four and five, found that poor visual acuity at school entry was associated with reduced literacy, such as difficulty naming letters. And then another 2016 study looking at um, ages four and five years with hyperopia of four or more diopters, that those kids scored significantly worse on early literacy tests um, than children with normal vision and primarily, or the areas included, print knowledge and identifying letters and written words. And so these are um, the citations in order of the studies I just gave you. But now I want to share with you a story from a child. And actually this is from a mother and I can't see this. She got an award, excuse me, I lose. She got an award. Um, 
Give me just a second to get to this. She got an award because she is one of the highest ranking children in her class in reading. So I said, this is mama, wow. And the child said, yeah, mom, I put on the glasses and I am reading. So the main message here is that the parent's story shows what can happen in the classroom when a child receives a vision screening. And if that child did not pass the vision screening, and the parent guardian receives a referral from the vision screening to have a confirmatory eye exam by an eye doctor. Then the eye doctor examines the child and prescribes treatment. Now, in this case, it was glasses. Sometimes it may be just monitoring, but the child is in the system and can be watching uh, what's going on with the vision. So this process helped a child succeed in reading in the classroom. And again, she was one of the highest ranked children in her class in reading after she could, um, after she received her glasses. And so here are some comments from teachers and, and you'll see that the citations are on the slides. So this uh, teacher said, these are the kids that when they had to work independently, they were distracting other kids. But when they got the glasses, that kind of just changed the behaviors. It went away. I noticed with one or two of the students that got their glasses, the actually accuracy, pardon me, the accuracy rate on their math work went up, probably because they could see the numbers better in the books. And another teacher said the fluency rate has increased for those students. They can see the words so they are more apt to practice reading because it's not such a task for them. And another teacher said, I think enthusiasm for learning. Just, I know one girl in particular that was struggling and she was so much more enthusiastic after she got the glasses and reading more. So this is from an older study, 1977, but did look at these students over 10 years. And um, the authors found that the first grade reading ability was found to be predictive of what was happening in the 11th grade concerning reading comprehension, vocabulary, and general knowledge. So these are some academic considerations for vision. Improved GPA, particularly in reading and math, more likely for hyperopes and myopes. Improved satisfaction with school. Reduced stress, that's important. Improved cognit cognition, improved attention span, improved focus improved test scores, less task avoidance and need for discipline, less labeling of ADD or ADHD, and earlier identification leads to improved outcomes. So we want to find these children early. So there's four steps to a simple solution of helping find these children. We do vision screening. We do either instrument-based or optotype-based. An eye exam when those children do not pass vision screening. And either treatment or monitoring. And treatment here was glasses. So if you look at this uh, website, which you will see later when we distribute um, a document of links. It's going to give you information in different languages. I'm using just English today, but vision screening guidelines by age. We're, we'll be talking about what to do from birth to the first birthday, observation, ages one and two years, ages three, four, and five years, and ages six years and older. 
So let's first look at the key year one vision developmental milestones. And this again is from birth to baby's first birthday. Ideally, it would be done monthly. And some of you I know may be using this document uh, from previous years. Make sure that the version is 5-7-2020. So this is an example. It gives the age of what should be happening here during the second and third months. It gives you the milestones for that age, questions to ask or behaviors to monitor. It gives you a chance to rescreen on some. And then next steps. And there's even activities that parents can do. So an example here that I want you to look at is baby makes eye contact with parent or caregiver and baby has a social smile. So what I'm going to do now is stop sharing. Anne is going to share so she can play the videos. The video on the left is what you want to see and the videos in the middle is when you would become concerned. So take it away, Anne. Okay, so that's what you want to see. Now let's watch the second and third one. <laughs> Näin, näin, yleensä tekee, että ei siis... Mennäkö se vieläkin lähemmäs sillä mm -hmm. noin? Pikkunen kulti. Katotko äitiin välillä, katotko tänne päin? Pikkunen kulti. Mm. Nyt sitten otapas hänen käsistä kiinni ja vienen mm. keski. Ja sitten jo. Mm. Liisukka Maria, katopas tänne. Liisa Maria. Katopas tänne. Pieni pittu niin. Katopas tänne, katopas. Niin kuin tuossa niin. Niin kyllä sitten yleensä heti kun tuota. Noi. No, mitä nyt te pikkunen tyttö? Noi, katoppas. Nytkö sä näet minkä näköinen tää sun maailma? Niin. Oi, ihana pikkunen hymy tulee sieltä. Thank you, Anne. Back to UK. Yeah, we're getting there. Okay, thank you. So again, the first video is what you want to see. You saw the social smile. You saw the reciprocity in language. You saw the engagement, the social engagement. And the second one, no matter what mama was doing, uh, she could not engage with the child. And you probably noticed the sibling, sibling wearing glasses. That's a, a red sign that if sometimes when siblings are wearing glasses, the younger siblings may also need glasses. And then the third video, which I have watched a hundred, hundred, hundred times, and it still gives me chill bumps. When baby had glasses for the very first time, baby could now see the face that belonged to this voice and gave mama her first smile. Love, love, love that video. Okay, so moving on. Um, when you're doing screening, you want to begin with observation before you screen. And you want if if a teacher makes a recommendation or a teacher sees something on this form, then you make a referral. If you are doing screening and the child passes the vision screening, but something still came up on this behavior or the complaints or the appearance, you would still make a referral. So it's very, very critical. You can share this uh, with parents so they can monitor at home. And again, you can share it with the adults in the child's classroom. 
So let's look now at screening for ages one and two years. So we had the, the other document from birth to the first birthday, and now beginning at ages one and two years. Well, obviously these little kiddos are too young to tell you what an optotype is. So you do instrument-based screening. And here are some instruments. Instruments analyze the structure of the eyes. They provide estimated information about amblyopia risk factors, which include significant refractive errors such as hyperopia, farsightedness, myopia, nearsightedness, astigmatism, where you may have blurred vision at both near and far, and isometropia, where you'll have a significant difference of refractive error between the two eyes. For example, I'm nearsighted in one eye and farsighted in the other. So that gets kind of interesting with all my many glasses. Uh, we'll also look at eye misalignment. Instruments, however, do not measure visual acuity like eye charts will or how eye charts will interpret the clearness of vision at specified distance. And I just share that with you because sometimes it gets a little bit confusing. So just to know that instruments are looking at the shape of the eyes and giving you the information about the eyes, but not measuring visual acuity. And measurements cannot be converted to a visual acuity value. So let's talk briefly about eye charts. So the importance of appropriate charts, according to Dr. Ian Bailey, is that the visual acuity scores can be significantly affected by the way the eye charts designed. And excluding the size of the optotype, and the optotype, by the way, is a Herman Snellen term, um, and that's the name for whatever's on the chart that you're asking the child to identify. So that's an optotype. So include excluding the size of the optotype, each visual acuity level on a test chart should present an essentially equivalent task, meaning you don't have some optotypes that, e that are easier to, to identify than others, for example. So these are um, the groups who have made um, eye chart design recommendations, both international and national. And to give you a summary across those, those groups, the optotype should be almost um, equal in legibility. I will note, tell you that with Leia symbols, Dr. Leia designed them so that when you get down to threshold, or where it's more difficult to distinguish one optotype from another, they will start to look like circles. To me, they look like holiday Christmas trees because I have astigmatism, but they do blur equally. Um, the horizontal spacing between the optotypes is equal to the width of the optotype on that line. The vertical spacing between lines is the height of the optotype on the next line down. The geometric progression of optotype sizes is in 0 0.1 log units. And I'll give you some more information about that in a moment. Five optotypes per line. Now you will have some nine by 14 charts, if you can see me, where you can't have five optotypes at the top because of the size of the chart, but you do have five down in the area where you're most concerned about. And you want optotypes to be black on a white background with a luminance between 80 and 160 candelas per meter squared. This is known as ETDRS or a logmar chart. Now some tips. If you were to draw a line around the outside of the optotypes, that line's going to look like a triangle or an inverted pyramid. It's not going to look like a rectangle. 
because if it looks like a rectangle, then it's not spaced correctly and it's not meeting how those eye charts should be designed. You want to see 2032 versus 2030 because if this 2032, it's calibrated in log, log units. And you don't want to see 20 foot charts. They, will, they typically will be in 10. You will see some, I'm talking United States here. You will see some in um, five feet, but you would not want to use any that are 20 feet. So as a little transition, we've talked briefly about instruments and we talked briefly about charts. So could this be our future of vision screening? Okay, now text the third line. You never know, and I guarantee you, well, I don't guarantee you. I'm hoping that if we were doing this in person, you would laugh, so maybe you're laughing. Okay, so I want to give you the cast of characters for um, the next few slides. When you see NCCBEH, for children ages three, four, and five years, that's the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health that Prevent Blindness. For public health settings, primary care providers, early childhood agencies and educators, community organizations, and school nurses, comprised of optometry, ophthalmology, family advocates, nurses, public health professionals, and educators. When you see AAP, or AAP, APOS, AAO, and um, still can't see. I need to move you guys again. Hold on just a moment while I do some little house cleaning. Okay. So that stands for the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology, and Strabismus, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and the American Association of Certified Orthoptists. So there are guidelines from, from both, national guidelines from both groups, but I didn't want to keep saying all those names. So these are some not so great charts. And very often when pre-COVID when I was doing traveling across the country doing um, lectures, presentations, there would be many people in the group using some of these, particularly the sailboat chart or the Allen or the Tumbling E or the Snellen or the Lighthouse. Um, so if you are using those, don't feel bad because now you're going to know what you should be using starting tomorrow or when you can upgrade. So these charts are not recommended by NCCBEH and or AAP. So no sailboat, no tumbling E, no lighthouse, no Allen, no Snellen, and no Landolt C. Not recommended by the National Center or AAP. So why are they not recommended? The use of validated and standardized optotypes and acuity charts is important to receive that accurate assessment of vision when doing vision screening. Those charts are not standardized. Children may not know their letters. Sometimes they're showing Snellen way too early um, because maybe that's all they have and you can only do what you can do. And some charts require discrimination of direction, like which way is table legs pointing. And that is not always that um, ability to do that is not always sufficiently developed in preschool aged children usually comes together about third grade and they're not well validated in the screening environment. So for optotypes beginning at age three years, the National Center and AAP recommend lay assembles and HOT, HOT 
TV as the optotypes. So there are two approaches to vision screening at the ages of three, four, and five. Optotype-based screening, and again, that's when eye charts. These are tests of visual acuity using these eye optotypes to measure the visual acuity or the clearness of vision as interpreted by the brain. And visual acuity is um, defined as quantifiable measurement of the sharpness or clearness of vision when identifying specific optotype sizes at a standardized distance. And then there's instrument-based screening. So you have optotype-based and instrument, but we're going to talk about optotype-based first. So within optotype-based or eye charts, you have two levels. You have full threshold, and these are full threshold charts, meaning you're going to go down until you to threshold until you can no longer distinguish one optotype from another. And I just said that. And then you have critical line, which I will show you in a moment. So an advantage of doing threshold is that you can find a two line difference. And here I give you an example of a two line difference, even in the passing range, which would still be a referral. So that's threshold. Critical line screening is you don't have the two line difference, but you are using the line size that the child needs to pass according to the child's age. And it is um, faster to administer. Here are a couple of examples. So the preferred optotype format from the National Center would be single lay symbols or HOTV letters surrounded with crowding bars for children ages three, four, and five years at five feet. So here are two examples. And the eye check is like this size if you can see me. And so you see the single and the crowding bars mimic the crowding that you would have in a full threshold. Um, some critical line tests. This is a new sight line kit. And what is great about it and National Center, we helped design it. So it still has your lay symbols. But when you get toward the back, you will see that it also has Sloan letters. So this one critical, so this is for both eyes. Then you'll have a right eye card. And then you'll have a left eye card. And that's it. Those are the only lines you use. Um, comes with cluders, so this is new, and you can, if you're going to do critical line screening, particularly during COVID and you want to do quick screening, that has been recommended um, on a national level, then this would get all ages. Then here's a threshold of lay symbols and a threshold of HOTV. And these are um, just some options or other types of screening. So let's talk about occlusion. When you give or covering the eyes during vision screening, when you give young children responsibility for their own occlusion, they're likely to going to try to peek. Now, this little guy with this, he has a slit between these two fingers, if you can see my mouse, and you can see how much is open between his little finger and his nose. You can see an entire body through that slit. So it would be very easy to turn the head and see the full eye chart. 
And while you would not be including a child this age, I just think it's a cute picture and wanted to share it with you. So let's look at what's unacceptable for ages three, four, and five. So no hands. And actually, that would be unacceptable for all ages. No tissues, unacceptable all ages. No paper or plastic cup, all ages. And no cover paddles. Now here, the cover paddles just for three, four, and five. You can use cover paddles at starting at age 10. So why are these unacceptable? Because children can easily peak. And if they peak, they're going to pass and you're going to under refer children. So what should you use? Um, these eye patches and two inch wide surgical tape are both recommended from the National Center and AAP. National Center also recommend, uh, recommends these occluder glasses. So that helps take away the responsibility of covering their own eyes. So we talked about optotype based screening. Now let's look at instrument based screening for ages three, four, and five years. Again, instruments do not measure vis visual acuity and looking at estimates of significant refractive error, estimates of anisometropia, estimates of eye misalignment. It's an option at age three, four, and five. You can do instrument-based, you can do um, eye charts. We always recommend that if you have an instrument to have an eye chart as a backup, just in case you can't get a reading. And that would not happen very often, but just in case. In an ideal world, you might want to try doing both, but time is limited. Um, so those are the instruments from the National Center and AAP. The re recommendation is to start instruments again at 12 months, not at six months, but at 12 months. Use instruments or tests of visual acuity for ages three, four, and five years. At ages six years, you move to an eye chart. Um, Sloan letters, whenever kids know their letters in random order, or instruments only if a child six years and older um, cannot do a test of visual acuity. And I know some of you are out there saying, well, why not? And it's because we have insufficient data at this point in time to show the efficacy of instrument-based screening for older school-aged children. We do have a few studies here and there that may be using enriched populations, but we don't have studies that are looking at multi-sites and looking at kids, um, like thousands of kids. So that, that can change, but this is the way it stands right now. And so don't throw tomatoes at me. I'm just carrying the message. <laughs> okay. So um, the um, what the, the I can't see the top of my screen, you guys. I'm sorry. So this is why I'm struggling. So the National Center approved instruments. And this is where the list is. Instruments on this list have supporting published peer review evidence. They went through a uh, significant process, review process by a panel, advisory committee panel of the National Center and are appropriate for use in defined settings. So those instruments that have been um, are that okay approved would be the plus optics 
S12R, S12C, X16 without the visual acuity add-on component. Again, uh, we just don't have the data yet to support that. Welsh Allen Spot um, Vision Screener, go check kids without the visual, acu visual acuity component and Retina Max. Okay, moving right along, but just transitioning to eye charts again. Would this eye chart be easier to use and easier for children to participate when using? My guess is probably yes. Okay, so now let's look at preferred optotypes. We say age seven years and older. It's actually, and it's kind of a gray area um, when kids know their letters random order. So sometimes it may be six, sometimes it may be seven. But when they know their letters in random order, AAP recommends Sloan Letters, American Academy of Ophthalmology, and a different um, document um, recommends Sloan Letters, not Snellen, Sloan Letters. So here are some examples. Now this APOST basic kit has Leia symbols and Sloan letters. There's also one with HOTV and Sloan letters and they're in a full threshold format or critical line. And then you have the eight by 14 chart and then you have a folding chart. So those are some examples. Now occluders for ages 10 years and older. The other occluders I showed you would be actually from age three up to age 10. And here beginning at ages 10 years and older would be the lollipop occluders. And if you can see me, this has a raised edge right here. So that actually goes toward the nose. So it fits in the nose, that raised edge, so you're holding it at temple instead of the chin. And those would go under glasses. And yes, you always screen children with glasses on. Or the Mardi Gras mask, which just flips. So those would be for 10 years and older. Now, referral criteria, uh, the National Center has a set, AAP has a set. So it kind of depends on the chart you're using or the referral criteria you want to follow. Sometimes the chart is very specific on, um, on when to refer, but both say 2050 for three. National Center is 2040 for four and five. AAP 2040 for four. National Center moves back to um, six years 2032, AAP is five years of 2032. AAP has been doing guidelines, I think since 1972. And this was a recent change in the 2016. So um, just, just being aware or that, and I'm not dissing, I'm just saying that's the difference or a two line difference in the passing lines, which I showed you earlier. So just want you to be aware of that. Now, if you are required to do near vision screening, a couple of examples, lay symbols, you have the option of doing critical line with both eyes open, and you can use critical line here, or the monocular screening done like you do with distance on this side, if you can see my, um, my mouse. Um, we unfortunately do not have literature that I have found at this point to show which is better, um, critical line, both eyes op open or monocular screening like distance. So right now you can do it different, how it, different states are doing it differently. And then Sloan letters when children know their um, letters in random order. Now, the important part here is this 16 inch cord and that 16 inch cord goes like right in the temple area and you want that 
cord to stay tight. It's very critical to keep the 16 inch distance when doing near vision screening. So if children lean in, you just pull the chart back, keep that string tight. If you are required to do stereo acuity screening, pass two smile test is the recommended test. It performed better than the, uh, our dot, the random dot E in the vision and preschoolers studies. Some children, uh, more children were untestable with the random dot E. So the pass two is recommended and can be used for preschool and school age children. If you are required to do color vision deficiency screening, a couple of examples would be the School Health HRR color screening book. And it is a screening version of the original HRR fourth edition, which has much, much, much science behind it, or the Good Light Color Check complete uh, vision screener. So those are a couple of options. So vision screening is part of a process. It's not a single event. We just don't go out, screen kids, say we screen 500 kids and leave and it's done. It's, it's part of a process. It's actually the third of 12 components of a strong vision healthcare system of care. And this will take you to the um, all 12 components. Another, the last part or the 12th component is evaluating your program and do this annually is the hope. So you go through these questions and they are fillable, it's fillable PDF, so that makes it easy. And then you write any needed actions and then just select three of those to prioritize for the next year. But this, this is always good to look at how well you're doing. So now let's look at some resources. This one is for um, preschool children and it's for um, teachers and it's um, think of vision. Sometimes we think that if a child's having trouble reading or is showing disruptive behaviors that there may be many reasons behind that, but we don't always think that it could be vision and the kids are just bored. So this is a document you may want to look at. At This next document is for um, Again, I can't read it for school age children. Sorry. This is the prevent blindness position statement on school aged vision screening and eye health. The link to that is at the bottom. This is a document that will give you tool examples, tool examples for all um, for all ages. So if you want to download that, um, there are Spanish versions and English versions. We partnered with the National, with the National Association of School Nurses to create a vision and eye health page. And this is based around the 12 components. And so you will see that the first one is family education. Again, different languages. The third one, vision screening tools and procedures. And then the seventh one, I'm only just pointing out a few because I don't have enough time. Um, systemized approach to follow up. Again, to be effective, a vision screening needs to have a vision screening that is not a pass needs to have 
follow-up confirmatory eye exam to see if that child does indeed need treatment or monitoring. And so we want to look about follow-up and we will be talking about that in greater detail in October. One of the learning objectives was to share information with parents about the importance of vision screening, the importance of the eye exam, the small steps. These are the top 10 documents. There are many, many, many documents on that page. And I will tell you, depending on the age of your laptop, it may take a minute for the page to download. But here you have the signs of vision problems that we talked about earlier, the association between vision and learning, vision and classroom behaviors, the difference between a vision screening and an eye exam, the importance of that eye exam, 10 steps from, um, from getting folks through vision screening to the eye exam, how to schedule an eye exam. It also, that document includes questions to ask the eye doctor, a document on financial assistance, if um, vouchers may be needed to help with the eye exam or glasses. And there's also videos on this website about what will happen at the pediatric eye exam. So that can make uh, folks more comfortable. We also have a vision screening certification course that is um, online, complete modules at your own pace, do a virtual skills assessment that sounds like a test and it sort of is, but we do lots of mentoring. We want pe people to be comfortable and have a good time at that it's a, a national certificate for three years and it also has five contact hours um, for professional development and this is from one of uh, recent uh, one of the learners that are for whom I recently conducted a virtual skills assessment and she wrote this in an email and I said, would you please give me this so I can share it? So she said, excuse me, just one moment. <laughs> Sorry about that. She says that the Prevent Blindness Children's Vision Screening Certification course is so amazing. And I hope that all schools, clinics, or any place that does vision screenings are able to get this resource and incorporate this course into their training. I have been screening vision for eight years now, and I can truly say that this course emphasized how critical poor vision can impact children and their behaviors as well as their learning. I work with children in Head Start, so I was reminded how critical the follow-up process for failed vision screenings are. Everything I learned from this course will definitely be incorporated into my screenings. So some other resources, this is a document um, for toddlers, uh, for screening toddlers ages one and two years. This will take you to financial assistance. We also, as part of Small Steps, want to encourage families to take care of their own vision in addition to their children. So this will take you for, to some information for parents, caregivers taking care of their own vision. So my call to action to you is use appropriate vision screening tools from birth through high school. If a child is struggling to learn or showing disruptive behaviors during activities, think of vision. It might be vision that's called, to, it might not, but it may be and rule out vision. Share resources and I know from talking to so many of you through the years, of doing presentations and doing virtual virtual skills assessments that you have great resources. We're just offering some that you can incorporate or you can use or um, 
but to share those with families about the importance of vision screening, how vision screening is different from the eye exam, the importance of scheduling and attending the eye exam if the child does not pass vision screening. And when I look at all the literature about the uh, gap, about closing the gap between vision screening referrals and the eye exam. So, so much of that literature points to parent education just because it's something that um, we all need to know. 21 years ago, I can tell you, I couldn't even spell ophthalmologist. And assist families with needed support to obtain the eye exam when children uh, receive vision screening referrals. So that's my call to action to you. Just a few more slides. So raise your virtual hand, and I can't see it, um, your hands, but raise your hand. Oh, someone raised a hand. Go person, go. Look at these people raising their hands. Raise your hand if you learned something new today you found this presentation helpful. Look at these hands going. I'm loving it. And you will make at least one change in your vision health program as a result of what you learned today. Thanks, folks. Yay. Loving it. <laughs> and OK, I'm almost finished here. So I promised um, one of the learning objectives, and then you will notice that I covered every learning objective. I'm very, very, um, I'll make sure I do that. So an important question to ask parents when conducting follow-up when those parents receive a vision, vision screening referral, and I'm going to give you two. One question is, how do you feel if your child wore glasses? Or how would you feel if your child wore glasses? Sometimes that helps you take a deeper dive into what's, what's causing the gap. Maybe um, they think the child's too young or maybe they think the child's too cute. There's many, many reasons, but that can help get at why. And that's what we want to get at is the why. And what is preventing you from getting an eye exam for your child? And how can I support you so that it doesn't look, we don't want to make it seem nasty. It's just, what can we do to support you to make it happen? We're going to be talking more about bridging the gap between vision screening referrals and the confirmatory eye exams on October 19th. So 2022, so look for that to come. And so I now want to end with a story and just a couple more things. So this was from um, another learner in our online course. And she said she received a letter from a preschool um, on May 16th, so very recent. The teacher stated that the child was struggling with her homework or with her schoolwork. The child was becoming frustrated. The child was becoming increasingly, increasingly negative about attending preschool. So I vision screened the child as well as the other children in her classroom. That child did not pass her vision screening. I called the parent to let them know that she needed to see an eye doctor. Several weeks later, she was seen by a pediatric ophthalmologist and she was diagnosed with astigmatism and myopia. Since she's been wearing her glasses, her teacher stated that it's as if a whole new child has emerged. She actually asked the teaching staff if she can work with them and her school readiness skills have improved. But more importantly, her enthusiasm for learning has bloomed. Love this story. OK, I quickly want to show you my floating hot dog trick. If you guys can see this, put your two fingers together, 
about, hmm, I don't know distance, about a foot maybe in front of your eyes. I'm stuck here. So put your two fingers eye level in front of your eyes. Don't look at your fingertips. Look beyond them. You'll see a third finger there. Pull your fingertips apart. And now you see a floating hot dog. Wiggle your fingers and watch that hot dog move. If you don't see it, call me. We'll have a talk. No, seriously. If you don't see it, it's because you're probably looking at your fingers. So you want to look beyond your fingers, pull them apart. You can even put all five together and have lots of fun. Okay. Thank you for your time and attention. This is my thank you dance. And now we're ready for some burning questions if we have time. Thanks, you guys. Thanks so much, Dr. K. And we do have time. It is three after the hour. So we have another 30 minutes. Um, I am going to say a couple things while you peruse through the questions, Dr. K, since I know you didn't have time. Um, a few people, and I'm sorry, I should have said this in the beginning, I got several questions. We will be sending the link to the webinar we are recording. We will be sending that out along with some other resources in the next few days. We just have to download the, um, you know, download the webinar, get it set up, and then we will um, get it on our website and send that to you. Several people have asked about that. Um, and then Dr. K, are you perusing or do you want me to, I looked at them all. Do you want me to throw out some questions that I wasn't I comfortable am, asking? Okay. I we am just, perusing and someone couldn't see the screen, only me. And I'm so sorry that you had yeah, to look at me for the last it was hour. Only one person and I'm sorry about that. Good. But um, one, one question that um, I think it would be good because other people might have it is the guidelines you're giving, do these meet? The head start requirement. So I thought other people might have that question if you could address that. And that is an excellent question and it depends on your state. Um, and that's not a great answer, but I would suggest. Let me back up. It's best practice, even if you're not my microphone just changed did something happen okay you're, Are back, you okay? you're back to where it was okay. i don't know what happened um so where was i it's it, some head starts are required to follow what's going on in the state some are to follow evidence based and and we won't get into what that's what that's about but the best it's best practice what I'm giving you for three, four, and five-year-olds is best practice. And you can, um, if your state has a Head Start collaboration office, talk to them, talk to your regional TA, talk to Steve Schumann. Steve Schumann likes to answer these questions. He's awesome. Okay, Donna, that's a great question. I have one here I want to. If a child okay, is offered the sailboat, or a tumbling e-vision screening, what should the parent ask for? And what is the triangle star, uh, triangle style vision screening called? The triangle style, that just says that the eye chart is, is, meets all those requirements. And I have been talking to many Head Start people recently uh, during the virtual skills assessments. And what they're telling me is if they're going someplace where there is a sailboat chart, and they didn't say tumbling E, but I know they would say that too. They are working with their families to be advocates for their child and to ask for lay symbols or HOTB. So I just, I think that is awesome that we're getting into advocacy here. Where can we order? Um, I'm not going to get into ordering. Um, do you know if this aligns? One thing, Kay, I, that I thought you should answer because it's a great question. A few people had it was um, some people mentioned at doctor's offices or in schools that they're seeing some incorrect charts. And how do we, is it okay to tell a doctor you have the wrong chart on your wall? So I thought you might have some nice language to suggest how to approach that if you if you happen to see that. I do, but um, let's just say that I've had many, I've been at 
different medical visits and I have said to them that I chart's inappropriate. I say it in a nice, loving, gentle way. And then they ask me why. And then suddenly I'm behind their desk providing technical assistance on what kind of chart they should be using. And I actually do some training while I'm there. Um, my um, The medical assistant, when I come back for another visit, since I trained her, she says she's going to screen my vision next time. So yes, it's absolutely okay because meet people where they are. If they don't have the appropriate eye chart, maybe they don't know what eye chart they have. And you could take that document in that has the, the recommended eye charts and work with them and just, just be an advocate. But yes, you can. And there was a question there, Donna. I'm stopping. I'm letting you answer uh, or ask the question. There's something about titmus, and I wasn't able to read it completely. There were a couple of questions about titmus. Why is titmus, you know, why is titmus, titmus not on our recommended list or our district uses titmus? So I didn't know if you wanted to comment on that. Um. Primary reason, insufficient evidence. You can't see what the child's looking at. Um, the eye charts aren't always spaced appropriately. And you will find more information on, and TIPMAS would be under the category of machine screening versus an instrument that, that that I mentioned earlier. So if you look at the um, age vision screening guidelines by age under machines and you will and the pre, uh, the prevent blindness school aged um, document, you'll see information. You'll see more information about titmus and machines. Are we on till 3.15 or 3.30? 3.30, so you're you're fine. People are still here. People are still asking questions. Well, I uh, hope that I didn't talk. Sometimes I, did I talk too fast? Mm -mm. No. Nope. Okay, good, were, good. Because sometimes were, I do. Um, one person mentioned that their district uses a vision app. I don't know if you want to make a comment at all about vision apps. I'm just starting to see research um, on vision apps, particularly during COVID. And I haven't, I don't, that information's not up here right now. Um, so I can't tell you, all I can tell you is that as of today, it's not on the recommended list, but that could change mm -hmm. as we look at, uh, take a deeper dive into the literature. You guys are asking great questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. thank you, that was, that was great. Um, okay, keep the questions coming, folks. That we're, we're um, looking at them all in real time. Uh, somebody's asking about the broken wheel test. No not recommended if you go to the um screening guidelines by age in the right hand side at the bottom of links there's a paper called characteristics of that of tests and in it you will see several several um charts that are not recommended and the broken wheel is one of those Great. And I'm answering a few questions that for resources. So please check the chat. I've just put in our list of evidence-based tools that Dr. K suggested you could take two doctor's offices to show them what's recommended. And then also someone asked about the vision screening certification course. So I put the link in for that as well. Um, and, and thank you. And, and Donna, let me just interrupt you for one, one second. If you, in advocating for the appropriate eye chart, and if you're a little uncomfortable about taking this document, document in and saying this is what you might 
want to use or should be using. Tell them that you attended a webinar and they talked about, the speaker talked about evidence-based eye charts and you may want to give her a call just to have a conversation. And because my contact information was here somewhere, I'll get back to it. But I'm always happy to talk to um, to folks. So that's another way too. If if you if you're a little uncomfortable, just ask them to give me a call and and we can have a conversation because there may be a reason that they can't have the appropriate eye chart. I don't know but we could mm -hmm. brainstorm. Okay, thanks, Donna. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Great. No, no, there's a good, there's a, been a couple of questions about children with special needs. So Debbie asks, I usually am asked for vision screenings for moderate to, uh, for kids on the autism spectrum, kids with CP, um, and that makes screening seem unattainable. Should these kids be referred? And I don't, I don't know if you gave those guidelines. So I thought you might want to attend to that yeah i did not get those guidelines um but we can so uh, all of those children that you just described and there are uh, there are several these children are at higher risk children with autism even even kids with language delays <clears throat> language delays these kids have a higher risk of also having a vision problem. So the recommendation from the National Center is that these children just send them on for an eye exam. Now, for some folks, you need to do a vision screening for an IEP or you're required to do a vision screening. The recommendation at that point is to use the tools you typically, or let me back up, not only for those reasons, but you don't want a child to feel left out. And I totally get that. You don't want to take some kids out of the room or screen them in the room and you're not that child screening that child. So screen with the tools you typically use. And then if they don't um, pass, then make a referral. And you can always let parents know that these children that you described, and we have an entire list, um, and I should have put that in here. Um, anyway, that these children are at a higher risk of having a vision disorder and should see an eye doctor and may be already under the care of an eye doctor so um, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thanks. I also put into the chat a link to our page that has our previous webinars and presentations. And we've done in the last year, year and a half, three webinars on, on the vision health of children with special needs. And so I just put that link into the chat. So I encourage you to look at that um, as well. Thanks for that. Um, we had, we had, there was another question I wanted to get at. Just give me a second here. Um, there's a question. Would you recommend for screening colorblindness in kids in pre-K ages three to five? Um, I can only speak for the national guidelines and at this moment in time, there um no text to recommend visual color vision deficiency screening that's not to say you couldn't because you have kids coming into a new environment um, that's heavily color coded it's just not a recommendation at this point in time and mm -hmm. I think, again, if you go to the, although it's school age, the preschool, uh, the prevent blindness school age document does talk more about color. So um, no recommendations at this point. And Donna, I did want to go back to one thing. and I'm going to scoot away from here just a moment. Well, you're scooting this... away. I'm just going to also mention that, you know, make sure you know what your state guidelines and, yes. and, and regulations are. Because um, 
different tests are written into different state guidelines. So for those of you who are uh, working with school-age children, you should talk to, if you have a state school nurse consultant, um, and if you're in a child care center, you can talk to them and you can also connect with the, if you're in Head Start, the National Center for Health, Behavioral Health and Safety. So there's definitely some, some places you can go for guidance if, you're, if you are looking for regulations in your own state. Go ahead, Kate. And say that agency again, because that's where people can find Steve Schumann. So Steve Schumann is with the National Center for Health, Behavioral Health, and Safety, which is part of the Office of Head Start, is the Health um, Technical Assistance Center. Um, you can locate all that through the eClick website, and I will, while Kay is talking, I will put that link in here. There's some great resources for Vision Eye Health for Head Start if you are in the Head Start system. Go ahead, Kay. Okay, and then returning to the color vision deficiency screening, and Donna, I'm glad you said that about different states. In some states, the guidelines, it is recommended color vision deficiency screening, and some it's optional. So yes, check your screening and then or your um, guidelines. And I wanted to discuss this behavior um, the symptoms document again. Um, personal story here. My granddaughter, who's three and a half, is wearing glasses, five diopters of hyperopia, and has accommodative esotropic um, strabismus because of working her little eyes so hard. Now, I tried to screen her, and Grandma Kay could not screen her in her house, and I'm like, you are the only child I have not been able to screen, but because of this document, and things that she was doing on this document, we knew absolutely to make an eye exam because she would cover one eye and we would ask her why. She says, because that eye's eyes tired or she would be squinting and um, or she would look at material with her head down, but her eyes up. So this document is so critical that again, if you see symptoms, if you see signs, if someone tells you, if mama tells you, any, and they still pass the screening tool, please go ahead and make a referral. Okay, I'm going to stop telling personal stories now. Okay. Thank you. I have one more question, and then we'll just go to our the ending slides. I have one or two slides, and I'll put the okay. evaluation link in again. Do you have tips about keeping glasses on in little children, ages I zero do. to three? I knew you would. And this will be our final question. Um, and and uh, so go ahead, Kate, answer this. I can question. tell you that my son, and of course, granddaughter was three and a half at the time, but son and daughter-in-law were so concerned that she would not wear her glasses. And I said, if she sees better, she will wear them and she is wearing them. Now, if a ch younger child is not wearing their glasses, have them glasses checked. They may be uncomfortable. They may be, the prescription could be wrong because I told you I'm nearsighted, farsighted, and I had new glasses and called them and said this isn't working and my the eye doctor and it was like you have new glasses you just have to get used to them and sometimes it does take around a couple of weeks but I said no my laptop screen is trapezoid they had reversed whoever made the glasses had reversed the prescription so check to make sure the prescription is correct that they're fitting appropriately and that they're comfortable and that should help I have no 100% guarantee that that will work, but it will help. Great. Thank you Thank guys you. for indulging me in personal stories. Well, it's a, it's a great story. Um, one thing I'd like to Two things I'd like to end with. One is a great big thank you to Dr. Kay Nottingham Chaplin for a wonderful webinar. And thank you also to all of you that um, 
attended today and asked such great questions. I think we got through almost all the questions. We will be sending you all the resources you need. Appreciate so much. Appreciate all the questions asking for these resources, and we will send these. And I'm also happy to tell you that Dr. K will be doing a part two on October 19th again from 2 to 3.30 Eastern, called Bridging the Gap Between Vision Screening Referrals and the Confirmatory Eye Examinations. We will be sending you that registration shortly. We are still working on that, but it is October 19th, 2 p.m. Eastern, so please save the time for that. And we are so happy that you have been here, and we really hope that you'll visit our website at preventblindness.org and nationalcenter.preventblindness.org. And we will send you the information and please do complete our evaluation. It helps us to plan for future webinars. And we have a couple questions specific on this one about what you'd like to learn about in the next webinar in October. So again, I wanna thank everybody for your time, for being here, for, um, for all of your interest in supporting children and being the best, um, being the best learners that they can be as we start our new school year. And so we thank you and best of luck and thanks to everybody. Have a great day.